Okay, can I invite members who are leaving the chamber to do so as quickly and as quietly as possible as we move on to the final item of business uh, today, which is a members' business debate on motion 11927 uh, in the name of Gordon MacDonald on gas and electricity standing charges. The debate will be concluded without any uh, questions being put. I'd invite members wishing to participate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I invite Gordon MacDonald to open the debate around seven minutes. Mr MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I also thank those members who supported my motion so that this debate could take place. It's an important subject that impacts on virtually every family in Scotland. After mortgage or rent payments and council tax, energy costs are among the highest items of household expenditure faced by my constituents in Edinburgh Pentlands. It's therefore disappointing to note that no Conservative, Labour, or Liberal Democrat MSP supported this motion. In principle, electricity standing charges are there to cover the cost of the energy infrastructure divided between consumers on an equal basis. But that policy doesn't work in practice for those paying the bills, as the standing charge also covers network investment, maintenance, supplier failure support and net zero targets. Ofgem, in the recent consultation document dated October last year, highlighted that the electricity standing charge for Edinburgh residents is £221 per annum, which is higher than the UK national average and 60% higher than the London standing charge of £138. The result is that 2.5 million households in Scotland are paying an additional £212 million more than if they were on a comparable standing charge with London. Compare that with a gas standing charge, which surprisingly is a fixed rate across the whole of the UK of £101 per annum. In total, my constituents are having to pay £335 every year before they turn on a light, heat their home or cook a meal. The higher electricity standing charge might have been acceptable if Scottish consumer, consumers lived in a country that, who live in a country that exports electricity to the rest of the UK were compensated by a substantially lower unit charge. But they're not, as the difference between London and Edinburgh unit rate is on average one and a half pence. Standing charges also unfairly penalise households on low incomes. This high standing charge means it is proportionately more difficult for low users to make substantial savings by reducing their usage. Those on prepayment meters accrue the daily standing charge even if they do not have any credit on their meter. When they top up, they must pay back all the standing charges that are outstanding first before they can use any electricity. At a recent meeting I had with Centrica, they highlighted that they would support the removal of the fixed standing charge and would support national pricing. Back in April 2000, Centrica had indeed removed standing charges from its gas and electricity tariffs. Then in 2013, Ofgem conducted its retail market review, stating we propose to have tariffs with a simple two-part structure that is a standing charge and a unit rate. The UK government accepted the recommendations and standing charges were reintroduced. Presiding Officer, Advice Direct Scotland and Centrica both ha also highlighted in their briefings the need for a progressive social tariff so that those who most need additional support due to health issues, etc., could receive it. And this proposal was supported by three quarters of the public. Another option that could be considered to replace standing charges would be block pricing where initial usage of energy would be at a lower price per unit. The, route, the rate would then step up incrementally the more units you used. This would encourage homeowners to invest in insulation, save money in the long term and help achieve our environmental targets. Presiding officer, Scotland is a net exporter of electricity, having exported in 2022 20.3 million megawatt hours and imported only 1.5 million megawatt hours over the same period. 
Normal rules of supply and demand should mean that the cost of electricity would be lower, as there is an oversupply in Scotland. But no, whilst we help to keep the lights on south of the border to an estimated wholesale value of £4 billion, so the result is that we do not get that benefit. In Northern Ireland, who are not part of the UK energy market, they have their own utility regulator. By not being part of the internal market, they have an average unit price of electricity, which is amongst the cheapest in Europe and is also significantly below Britain and Ireland's median cost. If only we could have our own utility regulator as Northern Ireland, we could all benefit from Scotland's energy surplus and have a lower electricity unit cost. There are yet even more stings in the tail for Scottish consumers in that the UK Government at the 2022 Autumn Statement introduced the 45% electricity generator level. This levy is a tax on the ordinary profits of electricity generators resulting from high wholesale prices caused by unique geopolitical events and remains in force until the 31st of March 2028. This levy became applicable from the 1st of January 23 and is expected to raise an extra £14 billion over the five years to March 2028 for the UK Exchequer. This is on top of the energy profits levy on oil and gas companies, which was induced, introduced in May 22 to respond again to exceptional profits. This brings the combined headline rate for tax in the sector to 75% which the OBR forecasts that this levy alone could raise more than £40 billion over the next five years. If these forecasts are right, then the UK Treasury will benefit to the tune of £54 billion by March 2028. Yep. Douglas yeah, I, I thank the member for taking the intervention. On the energy profits levy, would you like to see that levy increased so companies would actually be paying more into the Treasury? Gordon MacDonald. No, I, I'm quite happy that the levy has been um, introduced because of the exceptional profits. But my point that I'm coming to is that we don't benefit from it. Right. Much of the oil and gas and electricity that generates this additional taxation will have emanated in Scotland. On a population share alone, we would be expecting an additional funding of four and a half billion pounds to provide additional targeted support to consumers and to help maintain services in Scotland. President Officer Ofgem is currently consulting on energy standing charges at the same time as industry experts are indicating that standing charges may rise by 15% from the 1st of April 2024. I'm hoping that Ofgem will identify a way forward that has a more equitable price structure and removes the high standing charges from Scottish consumers. However, given that Ofgem reintroduced standing charges in 2013, which penalises Scottish consumers, then the signs do not look promising. Only independence will give us the power to shape an electricity market that is fit for the 21st century and provides targeted support for those who need it. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. I call first Ivan McKee to be followed by Maurice Golden. Around four minutes, Mr McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thanks uh, to uh, Gordon for bringing this um, motion today. Hugely important on a number of levels. Um, clearly, the importance of energy costs as a component of uh, household bills at this time of cost of living crisis is, uh, is hugely significant and anything that can be done to help address and manage that, particularly for those with more challenged budgets, is hugely welcome. Um, it's obviously a, a, a significant driver of uh, climate change and uh, something that needs to be addressed in terms of Scotland's net zero ambitions. And it shouldn't, of course, be also forgotten that energy prices are a significant input factor to economic activity. Um, and higher energy prices, of course, constrain economic activity right across the whole economy. Um, and it was, it, was, it was great to hear highlighted also, uh, although it's a very unfortunate situation, the higher charges that exist in Scotland uh, for energy, despite the fact that we are such a significant and increasing exporter of energy south of the border and, uh, and beyond. Um, it's important to recognise uh, the economic nature, uh, sorry, the 
aggressive nature of, uh, of standing charges and the fact that those who can least afford to pay end up paying proportionately more because so much of the cost is, is loaded onto standing charges before they even turn the lights on. Uh, it's something I've long thought should be addressed um, in order to help with uh, the cost of living and to make the energy market more fair and equitable. And I'm delighted that it's, it's on the agenda to the extent that it is. And hopefully we start to see some progress as the off-gem consultation moves forward. It, of course, also has that uh, uh, positive impact on net zero because it does incentivise people if the per unit usage uh, cost is higher to use less energy, who at the moment, because they can afford it, are maybe not focused so much on that. Um, so it will, uh, if implemented correctly, no doubt, uh, have a, an impact on reducing energy usage in total, encouraging people to invest in energy saving measures. Um, it's important also to recognise the impact on, uh, on small enterprises. Uh, I know that the FSB, this is something that they've been uh, concerned about and, and have issued some uh, information and analysis on. And I saw that uh, Kevin Stewart had uh, already put a motion forward to highlight the impact on small businesses. And again, the same economic logic applies. Smaller businesses with lower energy usage being hit with the high upfront standing charges um, is a drag on their economic activity uh, which needs to be addressed and is disproportionately impacts them more than larger businesses who are better able to uh, to afford it. The issue of, around prepayment meters has also been mentioned again hugely um, unfair um, situation where uh, customers who find themselves on prepay meters having to pay more for the standing charges and their usage. It's, it's good that that's been uh, leveled to some extent but important that that, uh, that that continues and that people who find themselves on prepayment meters should be paying no more for either the standing charge or uh, the, the, their, uh, their per unit usage. So, in, in conclusion, um, officer, it's good to see that this issue has been brought forward. It's good to see that Ofgem is hopefully taking it seriously. Uh, I think some of the reasons for not addressing it were, um, I, I, I'm kind of struggling to understand, if the argument is that, that, that the individuals who um, use significant energy and are uh, economically challenged um, would, would find this more difficult, uh, I think that the fact that the standing charge would be re removed completely would obviously put them in a much more advantageous position and if individuals and families who are in special circumstances find themselves in that position, I'm sure ex exceptional support could be arranged uh, through some mechanism to deal with that. So I think um, uh, as a mechanism to move forward, it's um, hugely welcome, very progressive approach to, to how we, we charge for energy. Um, and I'd really like to see that uh, of them conclude their consultation and move forward with, uh, with these changes as quickly as possible. And it is encouraging to see electricity companies are not opposed in principle to make this change, and some in indeed already have, uh, have taken steps in that direction. So I uh, thanks again to, to, to Gordon McDonald for bringing forward this, uh, this motion, and I look forward to seeing progress with it in the market. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mickey. I now call uh, Morris Golden to be followed by Evelyn Tweed around four minutes. Mr. Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This motion is classic nationalism, designed to pit one group of people against another. It is unhelpful, unwarranted, and founded in ignorance. It seems to me that at the heart of the SNP policy, I'd like to make some progress first, but I will happily secede later. It seems to me at the heart of the SNP policy is to remove cost reflectivity from Ofgem's license conditions, which, let me be clear, would increase costs. That is at least consistent with the outcome, if not the rhetoric, of SNP policy, which is in fact to increase consumer bills. And let me give two examples of that before I move on to standing charges. But happy to give way if the Minister... Yeah. Minister. I'm very grateful. Um, Morris Golden um, accuses um, my, my, my colleague of, of, of pure nationalism and says some other uh, unpleasant things about him. But he fails to realise that this is actually standing up for people that are disproportionately affected by high standing charges. And that Scotland is actually the third highest because Merseyside and North Wales are also affected and actually higher than Scotland. So this is actually a problem for other parts of the UK as well. Uh, I didn't that. refer to the member uh, at all. I referred to the motion. Uh, I think that needs to be uh, made clear. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you two examples of where the SNP policy is to increase charges. So first of all, on transmission network use of system, TANUOS, 
the SNP have consistently argued that Scottish consumers should pay more in order to subsidise energy generators in Scotland, primarily multinational companies. Moreover, Ofgem's latest targeted charging review of transmission demand residual means that every Scottish consumer will pay more. A floor approach to the forward-looking charge would result in an overall decrease in Tenuos charges for typical domestic customers, apart from those in Scotland. For North Scotland in particular, Ofgem notes that charges will increase compared with current charges, given the assistance for areas with high electricity distribution costs policy. Therefore, Scottish consumers pay more, and that is SNP policy. We see more of, today's, of that in today's motion, with the call to scrap standing charges. Those standing charges help cover the cost of the network and ensure cost reflectivity. So the revenue lost from scrapping them will need to be made up from somewhere else. But the SNP's motion doesn't explain that part probably because the costs would almost certainly be transferred to unit charges. That is the charge for actually using electricity. In other words, those with high usage would pay more, such as households in remote areas like the Highlands, poorly insulated households, and those reliant on medical equipment. Whilst the vulnerable are paying more, the SNP's policy would actually benefit affluent households. Citizens' advice points out, happy to. Gordon MacDonald. Uh, in my um, contribution, I highlighted that both Advice Direct Scotland and Centrica are calling for a social tariff so that individuals who have to use a lot of electricity because of health reasons yeah would actually be supported, and that was part of the, the, uh, my contribution. So would the member accept that we have tried to address the issue of people who are using um, a lot of electricity because they may have health conditions? Morris uh, My position is clear. I think there is work to be done in terms of developing specific measures for those who are uh, most deprived or on prepayment meters. And I also think there's a case to be made for a derogation in our remote areas as well. And that's something that Ofgem have previously looked at. But Citizens Advice points out that households able to afford solar and battery storage can reduce their energy use and their overall unit cost. With no standing charges as the SNP demand, those households could avoid paying their fair share towards the network upkeep. The bottom line is that this is not a black and white issue the SNP want to portray it as. No doubt they thought scrapping standing charges would be an easy way to pick a fight with the UK government, but it's a simplistic policy that risks harming the very people in society who need it the most. If the SNP care about lowering Scottish household bills, they should abandon their ill-considered policy and bring forward cogent, cohesive and researched motions. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank you, Mr Golden. I now call Evelyn Tweed to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Around four minutes, Ms Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank Gordon MacDonald for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. It is a shocking statistic, but a third of households in Scotland are living in fuel poverty. It is the grim reality that many people are going without heating in order to eat and save money. Meanwhile, British Gas has seen a profit explosion raking in £751 million last year, which equates to £85,000 an hour. This profit is being made at the expense of our citizens. Customers who use less energy see a greater proportionate impact of standing charges on their bills. They are having a real detrimental effect on those rationing their energy use. Fourth Housing Association in my constituency contacted me to highlight how this is affecting their tenants. Like many, these households did not use gas for most of the year. However, when sub-zero temperatures led them to turn on their heating, they found that they were already in debt. 
standing charges that they had not known about had built up through the milder months. Because of this accumulation of debt, the landlord was unable to carry out important gas safety inspections, which then led metres to having to be capped. To show what this means in reality, gas prepayment metre standing charges are around 40 pence a day. And if the gas isn't used for nine months a year, this adds up to around £108. Then a payment of £45 is required to uncap a metre so that the household then needs to find over eight, sorry, £150 just to turn on their heating. And this situation is ludicrous. Fourth Housing Association were fortunate enough to find funding through the Fuel and Security Fund to help uncap and top up metres. And the Scottish Government Home Heating Support Fund was also used to help pay off debts. However, this solution is not sustainable. Although the, the debt is now cleared, these tenants were left with no heating in the coldest period of the year which is completely unacceptable. Even more worrying, Fourth Housing Association have told me that this is exactly the same situation that we're going to find ourselves in next year for the winter period. We have already heard about the disproportionate sums Scots are paying in standing charges. We also have a disproportionate number of households on prepayment metres compared to the rest of the UK. Described as the poverty premium, Prepayment metres are one of the ways that those with the least end up paying the most for essential goods and services. This is wrong on so many levels, but especially during a cost of living crisis when so many are struggling financially. Historically, energy costs more per unit than paying by direct debit. The energy price guarantee is currently subsidising the cost of energy for those on prepayment metres. However, this support expires at the end of March and bigger and longer term changes are needed. But careful thought must go into this. Although those rationing their energy use might benefit from a change to volumetric standing charges, Ofgem have said that vulnerable people with high energy use would see an enormous detrimental impact. This could include those who require medical equipment, <coughs> excuse me, or those living in poorly insulated houses. A point that was made earlier. Ofgem recently carried out a consultation on standing charges and I eagerly await their results. And hopefully Ofgem are taking this issue seriously. In the meantime, presiding officer, I ask the government if there's any steps that they can take meantime to support these households. We need an equitable solution here that will avoid further harm to vulnerable people, especially during a cost of living crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tweed. I now call Kevin Stewart to be followed by Carol Mock in around four minutes. Mr. Uh, President officer, I thank uh, Mr. Macdonald for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Uh, President officer, standing charges are a regressive tax on ordinary folk. Uh, your ability to pay doesn't matter. You can be as rich as Rishi Sunak, have as many jobs as Douglas Ross, or have no money and no job. Everyone pays the same. That sounds awfully like Thatcher's poll tax, and indeed they are birds of a feather. The standing charge is, in my opinion, the modern community charge. Just like the poll tax, the standing charge needs to be replaced. And it needs to be replaced uh, by a system that charges based on what you use. Of course, uh, with that, there should be uh, a social tariff and discounts for those uh, in need. And of course, um, we should take into account uh, other aspects, including uh, rurality, when establishing uh, that social uh, tariff. That is the logical thing to do. Uh, not only would uh, a progressive per unit charging system be fairer, uh, it would actually encourage folk to use less power. Because right now, it doesn't matter how much you save energy, the standing, standing charge doesn't change. You can be at your lowest ebb, having switched off both your gas and your electricity, be sitting in the cold and the dark, 
And still the charge ticks away day by day. And that's not just a maybe. It's the lived experience of thousands trapped in the cold and the dark, unable to escape the charge no matter how little energy they use. And it's not just domestic customers either who are hit by the st standing charge. Uh, small businesses also get the same raw deal. Recently, uh, the Federation of Small Business uh, raised this exact problem with some small businesses in Scotland seeing their standing charges go up 12-fold in a year. How are we supposed to create a modern, vibrant, innovation-based economy when small businesses are hammered at every turn? I'll take Mr Lumsden's intervention. Uh, Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank Kevin Stewart for taking the, the intervention. I'm just um, wondering, is the SNP's intention still to create a state-owned utility company and would that be able to address the, the charges that he's uh, describing? Uh, well, Stewart. with independence, I hope that we would create our own energy company uh, and ensure that uh, the profits from that, uh, that energy company go back in to investing in that energy company and, in uh, and investing in public services. Now, I was talking about small businesses being hammered at every turn. Uh, I've taken your intervention, thank you. Don't just take my word for it. Uh, here's the UK Department for Energy Security and Net Zero's latest figures. All in, before VAT, the smallest businesses pay 24 pence a unit for electricity, similar to domestic customers, but a large company pays only 20 pence. It's the same for gas. The smallest businesses pay 7.4 pence a unit, bigger companies 5 pence a unit. Two weeks ago I wrote to the UK Government and here's what they said. The standing charge is a commercial matter for suppliers, although Ofgem, the energy regulator, regulates it. Uh, the standard, uh, uh, always in this case, is passing the buck. A typical passing the buck response. Well, in my opinion, Ofgem, Ofgem itself is not fit for purpose either. Last month, uh, they put up the domestic energy cap for a unit of gas by 7.7% and kept the standing charge steady. Uh, this is despite the wholesale cost of natural gas falling by 740 pence per therm over the last 18 months. It's not as if the power companies are up against it and need a bailout. British Gas just announced a bumper £799 million pound profit, entirely from buying natural gas cheap, but charging customers through the nose for the exact same gas. President Officer, it's time for the UK Government to step up to the plate and intervene here. It's time for Ofgem to do its job to protect consumers and not shareholders. But beyond all of that, it's time for Scotland that has the energy but not the power to become an independent nation to create a fairer country. Yeah. Thank you. I now call Carol Mochin to be followed by Emma Harper around four minutes. Ms Mochin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, and thank you from myself uh, to Gordon Macdonald for bringing this debate to the Chamber. So when talking about gas and energy, or gas, electricity, energy, power, we cannot do this without acknowledging the enormous power imbalance between, between the provider and the consumer. And I think other members, uh, particularly Ivan McKee, have mentioned this. It is well documented and I think universally acknowledged that there is that power imbalance. I think that we can all agree the way in which we purchase energy is not easy to understand, is weighted against some of our most vulnerable citizens and does not have a fair deal for users at its heart. The tariffs across the UK are unacceptable um, and the motion speaks about the rates in Scotland um, but the member will know now because the, the Minister spoke about it that, that across the UK the tariffs are enormously high and enormously variable and I, when I had a quick look earlier you're absolutely right that North Wales and Liverpool and um, we see as the highest in the UK so this is an inequality issue um, and it's right across the UK and I think we need to find solutions for fellow citizens in Scotland and across the UK wherever we can. The Citizens Advice Scotland 
Scotland is deeply concerned about the current affordability challenges in the energy market um, and consumers who struggle with rising costs and energy debt de accrued last year, they feel will continue to struggle even as, as we go into the fairer months in terms of energy. Um, so, citizens' advice uh, data, uh, other members have mentioned it, from July to September 2023, the Citizens' Advice Network in Scotland provided 18,546 pieces of advice related to regulated fuels, which goes back to the point about how complicated it is for people who are often in quite a vulnerable uh, situation. Demand for energy debt advice had increased by 34%. And the average energy debt for people who sought complex debt advice for the Citizens Advice Network in Scotland was over £2,000. Um, but in a short debate, obviously it's difficult to cover everything, but I think secondly, when we talk about energy, we do need to talk about the energy potential in Scotland, both in terms of climate change, but also who should benefit from the development of our energy potential. And the member spoke about the fact that Scotland is a potentially a very high provider of energy. It's a really important uh, element for me and for Scottish Labour um, and the trade union movement is what is a tra just transition in terms of energy? A transition that helps our planet, of course, but that it has ordinary people at its core, ordinary families and ordinary workers. How do we make that transition to make it fair? The ongoing cost of living crisis has shown how deeply the climate emergency and poverty are linked. Rising fuel costs in particular have sp spiralled, as we have heard from right across the chamber. But of course, there's other things like uh, inefficient houses, expensive transport. Um, all of these things exacerbate poverty um, whilst causing carbon to go out into our atmosphere. Um, the, the, the brunt of this crisis has, of course, been felt disproportionately by those living in the lowest incomes, and I think most members are seeing that. So energy, fuel poverty is a major concern, and we must address it whenever we can. Now, we know that energy tariffs are res a reserved matter, but I agree that the Scottish Parliament should discuss such matters to ensure we have an understanding of the consequences to our constituents, but also allow us to look at what we can do within our devolved responsibilities that will help those most affected. We need a clear plan that helps us sprint towards clean power, which will reduce energy bills um, for all, but of course for our most vulnerable. I'm very aware of time. So one of the other things I'm going to talk about is my um, wish to see us move to community-owned uh, community sources of energy, and hopefully we might get another chance in the Chamber to discuss this, because it is such an important matter. Thank you to all the members for contributing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Mohan. I now call the final speaker in the open debate, Emma Harper, in four minutes, please, Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome this debate, and I congratulate my colleague Gordon MacDonald on securing it. Gordon MacDonald has well rehearsed the arguments which show the inequity of electricity standing charges across Scotland and many parts of the UK. And Gordon eh, MacDonald's motion also shows in particular how my South Scotland constituents in the Friesland Galloway and the Scottish Borders are paying higher electricity standing charges than any other or many other parts of the UK. And at the time of checking, just as Gordon MacDonald was on his feet at 5.20 this evening um, on the Off-Gem site, it shows that in the north of Scotland, people pay 59.36 pence as a standing charge, and my constituents in the southern part of Scotland is 62.06. That's like 23.56 pence compared to London. You know, the, the inequity is quite striking. And that's before folk even use electricity, presiding officer. And for an energy-rich nation as Scotland is, it's plainly obvious inequality simply serves to demonstrate why the UK energy system is outdated and indeed how Scotland could do much better, of course, with the powers of independence, which would give us the control that we would need. Presiding officer, Scotland has recorded the best figures so far for electricity generated by renewable sources, more than enough to power the entire country. And for years, Dumfries and Galloway has generated electricity through renewables well beyond the need of its own use. And the region generated 
2,127.4 gigawatts alone in 2022, which is 8 per cent of the total generated renewable energy produced in Scotland. Yet my constituents in De Vries and Galloway, many of whom have renewable energy sites, mainly wind farms in their communities, see absolutely no benefit of these projects in terms of any reduced cost of their energy bills. Just give me one wee second. This is why many people tell me it's why they object to wind farms, they object to more turbines, because they do not see the benefits in their own energy bills. And I will take an intervention. Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank Emma Harper for giving way. Does the member recognise that consumers in Scotland, including her constituents, uh, in terms of transmission charges, which the member was referring to, actually pay less as a result of the generation of electricity because it's based on location? So your consumers and constituents, sorry, President Officer, do pay less. Emma Harper. I thank the member for intervening. I say, you know, my issue is like, and I'm coming to this in, in part of my debate, is that we have um, issues around transmission and generation transmission, then distribution, and that's only part of what the inequity is demonstrated for us. I mean, what we need to be looking at is a more fairer approach to payment for people's bills, which has been mentioned by other members already, like the social tariff for people who have medical needs, like their sleep apnea devices, electric beds, and other electronic equipment. So it's something that I think we need to be, um, you know, lobbying off GEM for is in part of their energy um, process review, we need to be recommending that the whole system is a more fair and equitable system for the people across the whole of these islands. You know, the, the cost to homes and businesses of the ever-rising prices has meant stark choices are being made and householders are choosing between eating and heating. And that's a reality for many and for businesses. Some simply can't afford to keep on going. And I'll come, presiding officer, I'm conscious of time. Um, the short debates don't allow us to get, delve into what the issues are. I'm part of the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly and our Economy Committee, Committee C, is doing a report right now about energy and how the market works across these islands, or in effect how the market doesn't work. And it is absolutely highlighting what we're experiencing in Scotland compared to other places like Ireland and Northern Ireland, which is what Gordon MacDonald described in his input as well. And Citizens Advice Scotland have also made statements about their concerns regarding the removal or reduction in standing charges and the alteration. So again, I would support the calls um, for changes in the way that energy is, is charged for consumers. We need to make it more fair for the people across Scotland and the rest of the UK. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Harper. I now invite Gillian Martin to respond to the debate minister around seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. I want to thank Gordon MacDonald, um, not just for his excellent speech today, but for putting this very important motion um, to, to the Parliament today. It's been, I think, pretty much every contribution has been something that I wholeheartedly agree with. I just want to single out, in, in particular, some some particular points that, that, that people have made. I mean, first of all, I want to first of all thank Carol Malkin for a really considered speech which talked about the, the inequality associated with this because it is inequality. And I'm really glad that she picked up on my point about other parts of the UK also suffering from that inequality. One of the things that gets... If there's one thing that I think I've heard the most since I became Energy, energy Minister going across the whole of Scotland is that people uh, out, in, out there in Civic Scotland cannot understand why we are a large energy producer, why they're playing host to a lot of energy infrastructure, like Emma Harper mentioned as well, but yet they have extreme fuel poverty. And they, extreme, and, and they just cannot square that circle. And it doesn't matter that they, we, it's a very complex landscape. It's the unfairness of it that gets to people. And I think she made some excellent points in her speech as well. Ivan McKee also mentioned higher energy uh, prices uh, constraining economic activity. Very powerful point. I don't know. Um, I've got obviously, high energy users um, have, got, um, have borne the brunt of very high energy prices. But the smaller 
uh, users as well having um, the same uh, standing charges just isn't fair. And these are the small businesses, the fabric of our high streets, the economic engines of our towns, our villages and our cities. Um, and I think that was a very, a very good point. It's uh, well made. Um, Kevin Stewart mentioned about switching off gas and electricity. I want to say one thing um, that I, I hope that anybody that that, that um, is struggling with their bills will we'll, we'll hear. And that there are agencies in Scotland that can help people in that situation. Gordon MacDonald mentions Advice Direct Scotland. We give Advice uh, Direct Scotland funding to give advice uh, on, 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 and uh, manage debt as well as being a sort of conduit to the utilities company. No one should ever be in a situation where they have to switch off their gas and electricity. Well, there is well, always help. Yes. Uh, Kevin Stewart. Right, no, officer, I'm very pleased that the Minister uh, has given the message that nobody should have to switch off their gas and electricity. But the reality is that we all come across folks within our own constituency who have been forced or they feel that they've been forced to do so. Uh, I think that one of the key messages um, that, again, the likes of Ofgem could help with um, is to get across that in some parts of the country, uh, 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 particularly here um, in Scotland, uh, that there is help out there. Uh, and they don't do that to the degree that they should. Minister. Kim Stewart makes an excellent point there. I think it's incumbent on all of us to be advertising on our social media out outreach to our constituents. But also, yes, maybe the regulator has a, a part to play in that as well. Um, the last three winters have been far from easy for the vast majority of households and indeed businesses in Scotland. I don't need to rehearse um, the, the, the price spikes and whatever. But we, we, we do estimate in the Scottish Government that, that under the current price cap, 840,000 of Scottish households are in fuel poverty, and that is a staggering 34% of all households. Now, we are expecting Ofgem's announcement on the April energy price cap later this week, and experts predict a slight decrease from current levels, although still much higher than the, the pre-crisis situation. The ongoing energy crisis has driven home the urgent need for market reforms. It is really painfully obvious that our energy system is not designed to absorb global price shocks and is not adequately protecting consumers. And then, as, you know, it's been made, uh, the point's been made by, by members as well. It's not just people living at home as well. It's people who are actually uh, employers and the lifeblood of our communities. Um, last year, um, in reaction to the, the, the energy crisis, I chaired three energy consumers working groups focusing on the challenges that vulnerable, rural and business consumers are facing. Three separate groups. The work of those groups informed my letter to the UK government with a package of asks in relation to consumer protection. In that letter, I argued for the urgent introduction of a social tariff mechanism for vulnerable and low-income households. I am very grateful to all the members who joined me in that call today. Um, support for uh, off-grid consumers in rural and remote areas and extra support for small businesses and also the, the, the high-using businesses as well. It is very disappointing, despite many meetings, very cordial meetings with UK government counterparts, but they've chosen so far not to act and deliver any support, both in the autumn statement and beyond that. And there is no, there is no sign of a forthcoming plan of action. Now, I just want to talk about standing charges. No, I'm not going to give way to Douglas Lums and you didn't contribute to the debate. The crisis drew attention to the UK energy market and one thing's obvious, the way the current system is designed and regulated creates significant disparities across the country. So many members have mentioned that. The statistics mentioned in the motion that Gordon MacDonald brought to Parliament, they are absolutely correct. People in South Scotland do pay £335 more a year, even for putting the kettle on. Many households, especially those that use prepayment meters, this is just simply unaffordable. And it's inequitous as well. So I mentioned that I have regular engagement with my UK government uh, counterparts, and I have repeatedly um, highlighted the issues of these extremely high standing charges, the impact on Scottish consumers. Now, geography can't be helped, and it does feel that people in Scotland are being penalised for living so far away in, in, in London, even though a great deal of energy production takes place here. Again, many members have mentioned that. But I did engage uh, with Ofgem very recently, and I received assurances. It's a very important point. I'd like to make it. I engaged with Ofgem very recently and received assurances that the regulator understands these inequities and is exploring the ways to improve affordability and bring about whole system changes. 
Now, I'll continue to make the case that members have made here today. I do agree to a certain extent with Maurice Golden that it's complex. It's a complex system. You don't want to have a situation where removing standing charges has unintended consequences. So it's going to take time. But I think we surely must agree across the chamber that reform is needed because there are people who are, um, who are not using their, their heating and still paying standing charges that are so much more in the south of Scotland, for example, than they are in the south of England. So we've all suffered the impacts of the energy crisis, but some people have been disproportionately hit. Um, a stick in plaster is not going to fix the problem. The Scottish Government have um, repeatedly put funds in place to help people at their most vulnerable and at their most precarious points, but these are not sustainable long-term solutions. We need root and branch uh, review of what's actually going on in terms of the energy market. I'm coming to close now, Mr Golden, and I would appreciate anyone who's actually in, been in this debate. This is not about, about political point scoring. This is about making sure that people have the right to have a warm home. Yeah. Yeah. They have a right to be able to put the lights on. Yeah. They have a right to be able to have hot food on the table for their children. This is not something that we should be doing point scoring uh, on, as I've heard repeatedly from the Tory benches. We should all get together, stand shoulder to shoulder, and ask the UK government to consider a social tariff, which I have to say I almost heard Maurice Golden making the case for. There are people out there who are vulnerable, who've got medical equipment. These people should not be subject to the same standing charges and costs that other people are. But I'll leave it there, presiding officer. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.